All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, make sure this works. All right, well, hey, everyone. My name is Jeff Ajewski. I'm a sales uh, software engineer at Salesforce. And today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, some ways and some techniques in which we can reason about Cassandra's performance using first principles. So uh, I'll start the talk with giving a brief overview of uh, the talk in general, the motivations behind this, why uh, I thought this would be an interesting talk to give. But a bulk of the talk will be spent in three parts. The first part will go over some of the core data structures used by Cassandra. In the second part, we'll look at Cassandra as a distributed system. And in the third part, we'll go through an example and how we can use the things we've learned, the techniques we've learned in parts one and two, uh, and putting them into practice. And then we'll end with a few takeaways. OK, so if, if you take one thing away from this talk, one way to avoid any performance issues with Cassandra, and that is don't use Cassandra. Uh, as with every problem and every technology, there are contexts in when where that technology uh, makes sense, and there are contexts in which that technology probably doesn't make sense. So uh, I, th I think there's kind of a, an inclination, uh, us as engineers, as people interested in technology, to use the most advanced or coolest technology out there. Uh, but that can be problematic. Uh, while Cassandra is a great database, very scalable, it's non-trivial to administer and there are, can be some gotchas. So uh, if you need Cassandra, it's an excellent choice. But if you don't need Cassandra, it's probably not the best choice. Uh, so if, if that's the case, like think about your problem, maybe start with a SQL database until you know for sure that the SQL database uh, is not going to satisfy your needs, then Cassandra is probably a good option. Okay, so what about this talk? What was the motivation? Well, I found online that there's a lot of blog posts about Cassandra performance, but they pretty much repeat each other. They all say the same thing. And that is basically that writes are fast in Cassandra, but don't read from Cassandra because reads are slow. And they'll say, oh, Cassandra is a write optimized database, uh, which sure, I'll grant that. But the idea that reads are slow kind of uh, chafed me a little bit specifically because none of these posts really show any benchmarks or any real numbers. Uh, so can Cassandra reads be slow? Absolutely. But they, by just by definition of using Cassandra does not mean your reads have to be slow. Uh, so that's really the primary motivator here. Similarly, you can come up with queries, very simple looking queries in SQL that are quite slow. So as with everything, you need to understand how your systems work um, and the tools you can use to interact with those systems to get the best performance. Okay, so let's look at Cassandra's core data structures. I'll start with this quote from Pat Helland, which I really like, and that's accountants don't use erasers, otherwise they may go to jail. And that leads into the core data structure of Cassandra, which is the log structured merge tree uh, or LSM tree for short. So these were proposed in 96 as uh, a, a new data structure where there are two mediums of storage for the structure. There's a in-memory structure, and then there's uh, data that's persisted to disk. The in-memory data structures is re typically referred to as the mem table. And uh, it's a tree-like structure. It, it's implementation dependent, so it doesn't. there's not a specific data structure. It has to be. Um, the pa in the paper, they, they propose AVL trees is a good approach. Um, data structure to use for the mem table. And then the structure on disk is what gets flushed from the mem table to disk. And this again can be implementation dependent data structure. So uh, it could be a B plus tree if you want it to, but it doesn't have to be. And in the case of Cassandra, the LS, LSM tree, as we'll see, is an SS table. So what's the advantage of using this LSM tree? Well, uh, when the mem table hits some capacity threshold, it gets persisted to disk. And the advantage there is 
it's being written to disk in a single process. So the write is sequential. There's no seeking involved on disk. So it's very fast. Um, similarly, when these mem the mem tables flush to disk, it's flushed as a, a pen append operation. So that's typically it just creating a new file. Uh, doesn't have to be creating a new file. But the point here is we don't need any locks for this flush to disk. Uh, now the two cons associated with this data structure are what are referred to as read amplification and write amplification. So read amplification, uh, we'll learn more about in the coming slides, but the basic idea here is in a zero amplification setting, so there's no read amplification, a request, a read request generates a single read. But with read amplification, a read request will generate multiple reads. So there's some additional overhead for a given read request. And similarly with write amplification, uh, in a setting where there is write amplification, a single write will generate possibly more writes. And we'll we'll see how this occurs in Cassandra. Now, as as I mentioned uh, a, slide, a couple slides back, Cassandra persists uh, the mem table to disk using what's called an SS table or a sorted string table. This is a data structure that was introduced in the Big Table paper uh, back in two thousand six. It is a very simple structure. It's just a list of key value pairs sorted by key. And the value is a, an arbitrary byte string. And this is important to understand. So if we have a sorted list of key value pairs, how long does it take to find a given key? It's logarithmic time. We you can use binary, binary search. This is a pretty standard uh, question in a like an undergraduate algorithms course. Now, what about lookups in SQL? Well, uh, in SQL, we're typically using, let's say, some kind of variant of a B plus tree. Uh, so we have some index structure, and we need to traverse that structure to find maybe some file offset. That's also logarithmic. Uh, now, of course, the base of these logarithms might be different. But the core point here is, in both cases, whether we're going through an SS table or similarly a mem table um, or a lookup in a SQL database, we in both cases we have this logarithmic complexity so the point here is that with cassandra there's nothing particular about the uh, like pure lookup process that's slower than sql now it's we'll see the interaction of the system as a whole what is what can add some overhead now as i said before when the mem table reaches some capacity it's flushed to disk. And this flush creates a new file in Cassandra. And this is what causes read amplification. So if we think about this, uh, as our mem table keeps getting flushed to disk, we have files that start to accumulate uh, on our disk. And this flushing is happening because the mem table is reaching some maximum capacity. So we persist it and we remove some of the data from that mem table, which means that the files on disk uh, likely contain different values. There's probably some overlap, but uh, there's no guaranteed overlap. And so what this means is as we're reading from these files, if we don't find a key in one of the files, we need to search the other files because it's possible it's just this specific file that doesn't have the key, but it exists in some other file. Now, what about... Uh, write amplification. Well, as we accumulate these files on disk, we can condense them or compact them. And this compaction process is what causes the write amplification. Uh, so you can think of in, uh, let's say, like the most trivial setting, we have two files. They contain a single element each, and it's the same key. The newer file is going to contain the more recent value written to that key than the older file. So in that compaction process, we merge these two files into one and we keep the updated value, the most recent value for that key. Now, remember, we're not deleting data anywhere uh, with, with Cassandra and specifically with these LSM trees, we're appending. So we add a new reference to the data with a new value uh, instead of overwriting 
an old value, which is how SQL typically works. Okay, so let's walk through um, some kind of pseudocodish slash Java uh, logic of what happens when we query a key. Uh, like, what what is the the process? What steps happen? So we look up a key and we want to get the, the corresponding value. So step one is check the mem table. Does the mem table contain the value for this key? And this is the best case scenario. If it does, then we can immediately return the value for that key. And in this case, uh, this is pretty similar to just hitting a SQL database. Now, the challenge is if the mem table does not contain the key, then what should we do? Well, the logic works as follows. We sort all of our log files by creation time uh, in that we iterate through the most recent log file first and the least recent or oldest log file last. And for each of those files, we do the following. We check, is it possible that this file contains the key? And if that's true, then we try to retrieve the key. If this is false, in other words, if we know for sure that the file will not contain the key, then we move on to the next file. Uh, now, note that I'm saying here, file might contain the key. So when we attempt to retrieve the key from a given file, it's possible we won't find it. So here, we're only returning the value for the key uh, if it exists. Um, so this might be a little bit of a head scratcher for some of you. What is going on here with this might contain key? And it turns out this is uh, a data structure called a bloom filter. It's a very cool data structure. Uh, and the idea with a bloom filter is it can tell us, a bloom filter can tell us with certainty we have not seen a specific key. Or it can tell us that we might have seen a key. Um, this is what's known as a, it's a probabilistic data structure in that when we get a positive response, it's not a guarantee that we have seen the element we're trying to look up. Uh, if, if you find this interesting, I suggest after the talk, you go read up on bloom filters. They're very extremely useful uh, data structure in, in a number of settings. But in this particular setting, it's great because uh, for a given key and a file, the bloom filter can tell us for sure it's not worth our time to search that file. And that's very valuable, especially if we have a number of files. OK, so what about Cassandra as a distributed system? When we talk about distributed systems, consistency is one of the key concepts we need to deal with. And consistency is, and you can kind of think about it as like the global state of your data during a read. Uh, I guess I say write or read, but we, we typically think about this in the read setting. So what, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, uh, let's think about this in terms of examples. So in general, we see the, the two kinds of consistencies that are discussed, although it's important to point out that these are not the only kinds of consistency we can have in a distributed system. But we have what's called read after write consistency and eventual consistency. Uh, if you're familiar with distributed systems, uh, like theory and stuff, read after write consistency and is also known as strict cons consistency. And this is the strongest type of consistency we can have. And what this means is after a write, any read will return the most recently written value. Now, naively, this might seem like obvious, like of course this is what we would expect, but in a distributed system where we have multiple nodes, uh, there is some leeway as to when we want to call a write successful. And in read after write consistency, we say a write is successful when every node agrees on the value. Now with eventual consistency, we're relaxing that requirement a little bit. And with eventual consistency, what we're asking for is uh, for a given write, after enough time, a read from some node will return that written value. Uh, so what does that mean? That means for any written value, it's possible we'll eventually see that value. 
uh, but it's not a guarantee that the value we read is the most recent value. Uh, another way of thinking about this is you write some data to a couple nodes in your system, but not the entire system. Uh, and if you read from a node that has not seen that data yet, you'll get an old value. But the system will propagate that data through all the other nodes. And eventually, if you keep reading from the same node over and over, eventually you'll see this updated value. Uh, this type of consistency, I think, was probably popularized in the DynamoDB paper from Amazon. DynamoDB is known for eventual consistency, and um, this is a big concept in Cassandra as well. Okay, so I, I say, like, consistency is, is a big part of distributed systems. Uh, so why do we really care about this? Well, there's a correlation between transaction latency and consistency. So the stronger your consistency requirements are of your system, the larger your transaction latency is going to be. And that's intuitive. Uh, if you need to have a transaction and you only care if one node acknowledges that transaction, uh, it's, it's of course, that is going to be much faster than if you have a transaction where every node must acknowledge that transaction. Not only do you have to interact with a, multiple nodes, but it's possible some of those nodes are bogged down or might be failing. So there's a lot more that can go wrong with um, a read after write consistency type level. On the other hand, read after write consistency uh, gives you some much stricter or stronger guarantees about your data. And as we'll see in this part of the talk that, uh, I guess in the third part, uh, understanding the consistency requirements of your application are very important to getting, to tuning the performance of Cassandra. Okay, now with, uh, distributed data stores in general, there's this idea of replication. Uh, I guess in the most familiar sense, even like backing up your data, like typically you back your, your data up to maybe a couple hard drives just to be safe in case one of them fails. It's the same idea with uh, distributed data systems. Uh, there's a couple additional advantages though. So with replicas, uh, you, you have a few things. Certainly, like if one of, if you lose one of the replicas, you have your data persisted to the additional replicas. That that's great, uh, but that's kind of like the obvious benefit here. Some other benefits of having these replicas is that you can read from one of the replicas rather than having to read from the same node all of the time. And it'll turn out that this is quite important. So in Cassandra, we use this term quorum to refer to the number of replicas that must successfully execute some transaction in order for us to deem it successful. So for example, if you have, let's say a replication factor of three, a local quorum write level means that at least two of our replicas within our same data center must successfully commit uh, this write and, and respond that it's been successful. Uh, now we can dial back this quorum to like, let's say one quorum where we only need one of the replicas to successfully commit their log. So that's a lower latency transaction, but it's a, uh, we're not getting as strong of a guarantee on persisting our data. Okay. So how does this, how do these two kind of combine? Well, as I said, uh, if you dial back the consistency requirements, of your transactions, then you can reduce the latency. And if you need to dial up the consistency requirements of your transactions, you're going to increase your latency. And with Cassandra, the, the dial we're dealing with here for consistency is the quorum, the read and the write quorum. Now for a uh, strongly consistent uh, or I should say, as we've been using the term read after write consistency, the requirement is that the size of your read quorum and the size of your write quorum are greater than the replication factor. And typically the replication factor is an odd number. Uh, I think by default, we set it to three, uh, but five is a common one too. Okay, so uh, assume it, let's just assume for now, we have an odd replication factor. So how might we think about tuning our application? Well, for the setting where the reads and the writes are about the same, then it makes sense to have our read quorum and write quorum equal 
And a good value for that is the replication factor plus one divided by two. So for a replication of three, replication factor of three, that gives us a read quorum of two and a write quorum of two. So that means for a successful read, we need two out of the three to respond. For a successful write, we need two out of the three to respond. Now, uh, setting number two here, where our number of reads is greatly, is, is dramatically larger than the number of writes, we have an interesting thing here. We can set the read quorum to one if we set the write quorum to the replication factor. So let's think about this. What we're saying is we're making writes more expensive and we're increasing the likelihood that our writes might fail uh, if they can't reach a full quorum. However, for reads, we can read from any node. So we can, we can dramatically improve the response from our reads uh, by basically just sending out the read request and whatever the first response is, we go with that one. Now in the setting where writes greatly exceed reads, uh, this is a tricky one, and it really is context dependent, but a, the easiest thing is to just go with num number one. So just set a local quorum for reads and writes. Okay, so uh, when you submit a query to Cassandra, let's, let's, what is the path of that query? So let's walk through this. Uh, so we submit the query. The first thing that happens is we hash our partition key of the query. And that hash determines which partition our query is sent to. And we can think of these partitions kind of like as hosts in our cluster. Within that partition, the first thing that happens is we check the mem table. Do we know, do we have this value in memory? If the answer is yes, then we return the response to the user. And this is the best case scenario. And in this case scenario for, let's say like a, a single quorum, so we're only waiting for a response from one node, the performance here really is not much different from SQL. And by that, I mean the request path is hit a remote server and that remote server uh, checks an in-memory data structure, returns a response. Or similarly, maybe we have to hit the file. So we have to go to disk, and the first file contains the, the key we're looking for. The problem here is if we don't find our key in the mem table or the first file we check, now we're, there's some additional overhead compared to a typical SQL database. And that is we have to start scanning each of these files. Although remember, we're checking this Bloom filter to see if the file might contain the key or not. So that gives us a little bit of a speed up there, but largely this is a slow process. Okay, so there's a question we don't return, a proposal that we don't return the data from the mem table. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So. The mem table keeps some more recent versions of our data. Um, but maybe we can talk about this after this session. I might not understand the question. Uh, okay, so this is a path for a query that hits a single partition. The thing we really want to avoid though is having to hit multiple partitions. And uh, this can happen if, if we uh, don't structure our data model correctly, or if we are, don't think carefully about our queries. The reason this is so bad, I mean, this hopefully is kind of intuitive, is if we have to scan multiple partitions, uh, maybe we're doing some kind of range scan or something, these, this is multiple hosts we're interacting with, multiple network calls. Um, and as the number of hosts increases, the amount of overhead is going to increase for a given query. Okay, so let's, using all of this that we've we just learned, let's see if we can put this together um, in a couple examples. Okay, so uh, we're using the partition key to determine the partition. Uh, 
if if we can't do that, so if if when we're forming our query, if we don't have enough information to go to our precise partition, then we're going to have to go to multiple partitions. Uh, this is slow, and this is why if you look at like any documentation on uh, data stacks or like just googling data modeling and in Cassandra, they always say start with the query and let that drive your data model. So you want to make sure at the application level when you're when you're designing your application and how you want to lay out data in Cassandra, uh, you think like what data do I have access to at the application level, and how can I use that data to generate my partition key and from that partition key get the data I want. Okay, so this example is taken from the original uh, Cassandra paper published uh, by some engineers at Facebook. Now, I've got here in red, this is deprecated. So the this example uses the an old uh, version of Cassandra. And so it has some things that have changed since then. Um, so I just want to make this very clear. Do not take this first example as the way you should do things. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this example is because this is just the, one of those things that I, I when you, you read it and it just changes your outlook on uh, problem solving. I thought this was such a clever solution to this problem. Uh, it was very elegant and very much like outside of the box. I, I don't know that I would have thought of this approach. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of value in at least discussing it uh, just to kind of illustrate like that the, a, a way in which to, design your data schemas here uh, is very different than how you might think through it in a relational manner. Okay, so in, in the Cassandra paper, they give one of the examples of uh, searching your chat history. Now, we have a requirement. You only want to be able to search your own chat history. Uh, that's kind of a given. And we know that, that when the user performs a search, we're going to know their ID. So we certainly have a user ID at the application level. Now, here's where things get really cool in this example. So uh, if you look through like release notes of older versions of Cassandra, you can see there's a release. Um, I forget which one off the top of my head where it says Cassandra supports around 2 billion columns. Now, modern Cassandra, they don't uh, support as many columns. And the recommendation is to not use like very wide rows. So don't have huge amounts of columns. Uh, but initially that was not the case. So we have a Cassandra that supports around 2 billion columns. And if we look at the, like a typical English dictionary, there's about 500,000 words. So we can support way more columns than we have words in the dictionary. And uh, what they did, uh, at least initially, was map the words to these like super columns, we call them. Be uh, so words of the English language, that is. So what are typical words that people are going to be searching or we would want to index on? Map those to columns in our database. Now let's think through a query. So a user types in, uh, I don't know, uh, scared cats or something in, in their search bar. So we, we want something with the word scare and cat. Those are, let's say, the two terms we're going to search on, and we have a user ID. So they take those two terms, and they map those to column names. They have a username, so that can give us a row. And then for those column families, we can look at message IDs as the corresponding columns. To me, like that, that just like was very clever, in my opinion. Now, maybe you are, can argue, like, well, there's better ways to do this. Sure, but that is a very cool and clever solution to this problem and perform it. It took advantage of how Cassandra was designed at the time. Uh, I gave them a very performant solution. Okay. So now I said, don't, don't use that approach because that is based on an old version of Cassandra. Things have changed since then. So let's think through uh, using what we've discussed so far, how we might 
implement a similar search process uh, with a more modern Cassandra. However, I want to caveat this with uh, maybe the best approach here is to uh, consult some information retrieval texts and uh, think about it from an IR perspective rather than forcing the usage of Cassandra. Additionally, the solution we come up with may not be the most optimal, but the point here really is the process, the journey we go to to arrive at our solution, not so much the solution itself. Uh, my hope is that after this talk, you're better equipped to kind of think through how should we structure our data in Cassandra so as to uh, get better performance. Uh, similarly, how should we tune consistency requirements? Okay. So how do we do this? First things first, what data do we have on the application side? Uh, we are going to have a user ID, and we're going to have the query terms. Uh, oh, yeah. So as I said in the previous slide, consideration one, maybe don't use Cassandra for this, but uh, this is a talk on Cassandra, so we're going to do it. And as before, we only want users to search their own messages. That's, I think, kind of goes without saying. Now, another thing here is we don't have to show the user everything right up front. front. Um, and another point we'll touch on in a slide or two is that users might have some of the messages already cached on their machine. OK, so naively, what we might do is have a table that just stores all of our messages. Uh, we look message up by message ID. And we have a user table, so we can look up for a given user uh, user information, but if we want to query all messages from a user for search, then we would say something like select all the messages from our messages table where the user ID is equal to this searching user. That gives us all messages, and we can pipe that into Spark and do some analytics on it, maybe do some processing. And this is very slow, much too slow for what we want. The problem here is with this approach, when we say, give us all messages for this specific user, we are going to have to scan through all partitions of the messages table. Remember, we're saying here that messages are partitioned on message ID. Uh, so all messages, we're going to have to search through all partitions, very slow. Now, we might be able to structure things a little bit better to improve that scanning, but um, largely, this is not how we want to approach the problem. OK, so for a given query, as I said, we will have a list of query terms and a user ID. Uh, so if, let's say, we're searching for conversations that are about scared cats, uh, we might have the search terms would be scared cats, and we might trim those down to scare and cat. And the results we're going to return to the user should contain should should be all of the messages that contain maybe one or two of these terms. And I suppose we could rank the the higher the hit rate, so the more terms are in a message, maybe that ranks higher in the search rate. So here's an idea. What if we partition our data based on user ID and query term, and we cluster it based on query term? So what what does this mean? This means uh, for a given query, the, for let's say for a given message, uh, the partition is determined by the user ID and a query term. And then we group all messages for a given user and query term together. And uh, we can store there, let's say, like a message ID. Now, uh, there's a few things here. So one is we're replicating data. Uh, and there's NoSQL world, and it's particularly with Cassandra, and it's say probably most NoSQL databases, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but we do have to be careful. In this specific case, because we're replicating based on query terms, there actually could be quite a bit of replication going on here. So it's probably better to store the message ID rather than the message body itself. And why is that okay? Well, remember, the query here is based on the user query typed into the search bar. So we don't need to do any post-processing on the message body 
once we have that message. In other words, what this query is telling us is that this message ID for this is associated with this user ID and has this term in it. So no additional processing necessary. The advantage to this is that a given query gets us exactly to the right partition. Another advantage is we have separated our general like search query into terms. So we can run those queries in parallel. Uh, that'll give us a performance boost. Now there is a, a, a downside here, and that is we are grouping based on query term. And as with every language, some words are more common than others. So this can, do, uh, if we're not careful, this can uh, create some hotspots in our database. As an example, the word the is extremely common. That's probably gonna show up in every chat message. That would definitely create a hotspot in the database. However, the word the doesn't really contain much information. Um, Oh, an excellent point here that some some users like bots would have tons of messages. Yes. And uh, in that setting, I would I would go so far as to say maybe we have some analysis on uh, are these messages bot generated and how we want to handle that. That's an excellent observation. Uh, so with respect to the more frequent word usage, as I was saying, the word the uh, is very common. On the other hand, remember the ultimate goal here is to take a search query from the user and convert that into messages. So if we're searching on the word the, it's probably gonna give us every message of that user and that's not very useful. Uh, in other words, what we might say is the term the does not contain a lot of information. It doesn't help us narrow down our search. So some of these very frequent words can probably be filtered out. Things like the, a, i, uh, we probably don't need to include all of that. But this is certainly a downside to this approach and something to be aware of. Watch for hotspots. Okay, so I, I think that's like, it's pretty interesting on its own, just thinking through that problem. I, I certainly, when I was preparing this talk, had a lot of fun thinking about that. But uh, we can dig in even more, and that is thinking about consistency. So how should we think about consistency of our application here? or of, of, of the database. Well, one thing, one thing is for sure, we don't wanna lose messages. Uh, I think users would generally be pretty upset if their chat messages were randomly getting deleted. Similarly, like if you're a Google and you're providing email and emails are starting to get randomly get deleted, that's uh, not good, right? But the read operation here, so search, we have two important things. One is search is pretty infrequent operation, right? Like. Uh, uh, certainly like with, uh, you know, my email clients and my search clients, I am rarely searching. So this is a low frequency operation. Uh, two, I don't expect this to be instantaneous, although the faster it is, the greater. Like, you know, I, I would love for it to be instantaneous, but I think users generally expect a little bit of a delay in a search query. But lastly, and most importantly, is that this search does not need to return the most recently written data. This is particularly true with chat. So think of uh, you're a user on Facebook and you're trying to look up all messages that uh, talk about scared cats or whatever. Uh, you're probably not looking for the message you just sent to your friend, right? Or your, your most recent messages. You're probably not looking for the one you just hit enter on. Typically people go to a search, like a chat search, to search historical messages. So in the, because of this context here, this search context, we can get away with not showing the most recent writes to this user's messages. So how would we structure this? Well, our writes should be like local quorum is probably good. We uh, Local quorum is probably good enough, but if we're um, maybe full quorum, uh, if we wanna be particularly cautious, and that's fine, there's, there's nothing surprising there. But since we're okay with stale data, we can dial down our read consistency, our read quorum to one and say, we're okay with any response we get back. That will dramatically improve the latency on our reads. Uh, I just wanna hammer this point in. 
because in our application context, we know we don't need the most recent data, we can improve our performance by dialing down the consistency on our reads. It's, that's, it's a, a very important takeaway. I think there's probably uh, this kind of like default setting for most people where we think like, oh, we, we can't have eventual consistency. We need, we always need to use local quorum or a full quorum for our reads or writes. That's not always the case. Uh, you'd be surprised, really, if you if you give it some careful thought um, on when you really need that strong consistency. It's it's not as often as you might think. Okay, so what about some takeaways? Most importantly, uh, maybe I shouldn't say most importantly, but certainly very important. Understand the consistency requirements of your application. Uh, if you need strong consistency or this read after write consistency, that there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. There are a lot of settings where that is required, but if you can get away with reduced consistency at the application level, uh, you can really get some performance improvements from that. Understanding your read and write load is also very important uh, for tuning your consistency. I, I would argue kind of like in general, if you're building a distributed system, this is one of like the first steps. You need to understand your traffic, your read and write traffic. Um, but in particular with Cassandra, this can kind of dictate how you tune your read and write quorums. Um, I'm sure like this has been pounded into all of us ad infinitum, but start with the query and use that to guide your data model. So it, in the example we just went through, we started with uh, what data will we have at the application and how can we use that to structure our query to give us the data we want? And then from there, we had our data model. And as we noted, one uh, key thing when you're running a query is you want to avoid hitting multiple partitions. If you can hit a single partition, you're golden. And maybe I shouldn't say that, but th I mean, that's like the ideal setting, right? Hit a single partition. Do not scan over multiple partitions if you can help it. Um, as we noted in the example, watch out for hotspots. And if you can, Structure your data so that it's evenly spread across partitions. Uh, hotspots um, can be problematic, especially if they're generated based on like popularity. So um, if we have, for example, a hotspot based on word frequency and every search is containing that popular word, then we're going to cause a lot of congestion when we're doing a read operation. And that's it for this talk. So um, I think we've got a few minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, um, now's the time to ask them. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, Laxmacon, excellent observation. Yes, you are correct. The the mem table may not contain all of the information we need to return. I, I see what you're getting at with your initial question. Yes, that that is an excellent observation. Uh, yeah, very good. So the the question was uh, in, in, earlier in the talk. I mentioned if we hit the mem table, we get the value, we return it. Uh, it's not in, really correct. Um, the mem table will contain like some partial information. We still will have to get uh, any information that's missing from disk. So that will uh, require a scan uh, from disk, which is slow, but uh, I would argue it's not materially slower than hitting a SQL database. But that, that is a very good observation, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining in. Um, I'll stick around a little longer if there are any other questions. All right, pa Pavel, yeah. Excellent uh, point. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at different compaction strategies and how that can impact things. Uh, Kai. Okay, so Kai asked, how would you deal with hot partitions? 
uh, th that's hard to say in a general sense. Um, it, it really, I think, kind of depends on, on the problem. So for I'll, I'll just speak to the example I gave where we're doing a search uh, on message messages or so indexing messages. Um, yeah, so I would probably spend some time analyzing like what makes an effective query and is there any way we can reduce the uh, amount of noise in our queries? So like, for example, removing the word the from the queries, that helps reduce noise in the query itself, but would also reduce hotspots uh, in our cluster. Um, and for your specific case here, the, the simplest thing that comes to mind is um, moving wh whatever, whatever is specific about the data that's causing that hotspot, moving that field around uh, so that the data is now stored on different partitions. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, in the query, the, the, the query word case, if we were to move the word to like a more part of the partition ID, then we're getting more spread across the cluster rather than what we were actually doing. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's the opposite of what we want. In the search case here, I think the simplest solution is just trying to eliminate that word somehow. Um, but yeah, that's a very interesting question. And Edward says, uh, start with a query. Oh, and that's done for relational databases too. Yeah, I think it's very powerful. I'll have to read through this. Oh, very cool link. Hey, thanks for sharing that, Edward. That's a very cool link. Okay, Raymond says, let's see, batch workloads with queries that hit multiple partitions from different tables, but with the same partition key so that the partitions are still on just one node. So I don't have any experience in this specific setting, but my question to this would be, uh, why do they have the same partition key? That, that's kind of the red flag to me. How can we rework the partition key uh, so that we can distribute this across? Uh... Yeah, so that, that that's, w without knowing more details, it's hard to say, but that's that's what I would, that, that would be what I was am looking at. Why Why are they all the same partition key? If you if you note from earlier in the talk, we structured our data specifically so our queries would have different partition keys. Um, and I'll also add, like th these are all great questions. I personally don't think there's none of this stuff is ever obvious. It, it takes some time of some careful thinking of uh, what makes the most sense. Uh, thinking through different solutions, how would the query be routed in the system? Yeah, these are all really good questions. All right. Um, I don't know if if there's a limit to how long I can stay in here answering questions, but it looks like questions are kind of dying down. If 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 I haven't answered any questions or you want to talk offline, um, I think I'm pretty easy to find online. I've got a pretty unique last name, um, and yeah, you, you should be able to easily find me on LinkedIn, or uh, you could probably even guess my email address. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everyone for attending, and I, I think we'll uh, close the session at this.